So hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about um, a subject that's close to my heart, which is uh, searching for electromagnetic counterparts to LIGO sources with ZTF. And I'm a graduate student. I'm in my fourth year transitioning to fifth year here at Caltech. So let me start with a brief outline. So I start about I'll start talking about a history of multi-messenger astronomy very, very briefly. I'll touch on a little background uh, about LIGO interferometers. Then I'll talk about GW1717. Hunting for kilonovae during O3, specifically from binary neutron star mergers. Then I'll go a bit into neutron star black hole mergers and just finish with just some teasers for some of the other topics that are going to be covered in the school. So let's start with a brief history of multi messenger astronomy. So the first question is why multi messenger astronomy, right? Uh, so all of you have signed up for the school because you have um, varying degrees of expertise and interest in the subject. And one particular analogy that I like uh, is that imagine that you are in a new place in pitch darkness. So how would you find out more about your surroundings? So in this case, we might imagine that our sense of sight is impaired, right? You don't, we're not able to infer things about our surroundings based on our eyesight. So what else can we use? Um, we can listen for things, right? If maybe there are other people in a place that we're in and they're making sounds. So we understand, okay, there are more people or maybe there are more, maybe there are animals, right? Um, on the other hand, uh, we could use our sense of touch to infer, okay, are we in a room? Are we in a forest? Um, what are our surroundings like? So the point I'm trying to make here, this is just a very crude analogy, um, is that multiple messengers can be likened to our multiple senses because they reveal to us different clues about the universe that we live in. And using this information, which is sort of orthogonal, we can actually infer more about the sources that we are interested in. So, um, so, so that's, that's, that's an analogy that I just wanted to share with you. So, um, I'm wondering how many of you know what the first multi-messenger source is. I'll give you maybe like, maybe 20 seconds to just type your guess in the chat. Um, or if you're in the room, feel free to, you know, share it with your neighbor or something. Anyone knows what the first multi-messenger source is? Yeah, yes, I see. Okay, yes, some people, yes, I see some right answers here. Um, yeah, so uh, I also thought it was 1987A. Um, as some others did, but as others correctly pointed out, it is the sun. Um, so in 1968, the detection of uh, solar neutrinos. So yes, people who put neutrinos also partially correct, right? Um, so this is a graph showing the flux at Earth as a function of the neutrino energy. And you can see, yes, um, there are de detections of solar neutrinos. The sun is the first multi-messenger source. Um, but as you all know, the second infamous uh, multi-messenger source that is usually referred to in this context is supernova 1987A. And it was the nearest core collapse supernova to Earth, which exploded in the large Magellanic cloud. And um, just hours before, neutrinos were detected. And so this allowed for tests of gravity, constraints on the neutrino mass and charge, um, inferences about the supernova remnants, and uh, in addition, many exquisite optical observations happened of this source, which is very rare and very nearby. So that is um, the 
brief history that I wanted to share with you. So now let's get a little bit into the LIGO Virgo interferometers. So as many of you I'm sure are familiar, there are four main gravitation wave interferometers currently. I'm excluding GEO 600. That's because the sensitivity of GEO 600 is quite different from the sensitivity of these um, interferometers. So the two interferometers located in the US are the LIGO Livingston Observatory and the LIGO Hanford Observatory, which are both located in the US. And uh, there's also Virgo Observatory located in Pisa, Italy, and Kagura located in Hida, Japan. And the reason these interferometers are placed around the world, literally on diametric opposite places in the globe, is actually to enable um, better localizing ability with uh, joint localization with these detectors. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and the main feature of these interferometers that make them, that control their sensitivity, um, well, I guess I'm simplifying a little bit here, but the point is that um, gravitational wave detectors are sensitive to strain. And so for that reason, the length of their arms in a large part dictates how sensitive they are to gravitational waves. And so the longer the arms are, the more sensitive they would be. And uh, in this case, LIGO Livingston, LIGO Hanford have four kilometer arms. Um, and the sensitivity is quantified by a quantity known as the binary neutron star range, which is the angle average distance out to which a gravitational wave detector can detect a binary neutron star merger. Okay, so how do interferometers actually work? So in this diagram here, we have this laser. The laser is shot towards this beam splitter, which splits the light beam in two. And the light pulse travels along the length of each of the interferometer arms, hits this mirror and returns. Now, in a case where there's no wave detected, um, that just means that there is no change in the length of the arms. And so you do not you know, measure any, um, uh, any light pulse at the detector. But in a situation where the arms are actually differentially modified in their in their length then you actually do get some kind of you get you get an interference pattern right and thus you would measure it at the location of the detector so this is a basic sketch um of course the ligo interferometers are much more complex but this is a basic idea of how these interferometers work to detect gravitational waves so when a gravitational wave passes through the earth it differentially alters the length of the interferometer arms. And so, um, and so you end up measuring a signal here at the detector. And um, from those voltage signals, a gravitational wave signal is reconstructed. And that's the, the signal that we tend to be more familiar with. with. So a little bit more about gravitational wave sources. So a gravitational wave source can be described by various properties. These include the extrinsic parameters and intrinsic parameters. And these directly affect the way the gravitational wave signal looks. Now, these are not the same as the parameters that are inferred from a gravitational wave signal. So in other words, these are not necessarily the parameters that um, the gravitational wave detection pipelines and parameter inference pipelines are most sensitive to. So just to summarize here, um, this is not the full list. I'm, I'm you know, leaving out some of the, some parameters that may be of interest in some scenarios, but in general, 
uh, gravitational wave source can be described by its position information, so the R in deck, the distance, which changes the amplitude of the gravitational wave uh, signal, arrival time at the geocenter, the inclination angle, so how it's oriented with respect to the Earth, polarization angle, coalescence phase, and then some of the intrinsic parameters that are um, important include the component masses, which alter the shape of the signal, and the spins, um, which also alter the phase of the gravitational wave signal. And um, the other uh, part here that we are very concerned with um, as observational astronomers are trying to look for electromagnetic radiation associated with gravitational signals is the localizations. So I'm just going to walk you through a very simple, a simplified example of how triangulation works. Um, just to give you a little bit of intuition here. So, um, so imagine that you have a two detector system. You're only concerned with Hanford detector here and Virgo detector here. So the difference in arrival time of a source located here at S, and please excuse my crude drawing skills, um, can be described as the dot product between the distance here between these two detectors and the location position of the source here at S. So if you were to expand this dot product, you can actually write this distance in terms of light travel time, um, or you can express this in light seconds. Uh, so for example, the light travel time between Hanford and Livingston is 10 milliseconds. So this is just the light travel time here times cosine theta, where theta is defined as this angle, which is the, the normal to the plane containing the detectors um, and the uh, uh, viewing angle to the source. So effectively, you can see that this this equation describes the equation of a circle. So you end up with an infinitely thin annulus for, for where the source could have come from in the sky if you were to just use arrival time information to localize a source. In practice, it's, of course, more complex, right? Um, because the arrival time is not precisely measured. You have an uncertainty. And so that uncertainty gives you a thick annulus, right? You have some width to the annulus. And in addition to that, you can use information from the amplitude and the phase of the gravitational wave signal in order to basically exclude some regions of this annulus that are, um, that are no longer plausible due to the amplitude and phase information. So that's where you get your characteristic banana-shaped localization for a two detector network. What happens when you add a third detector? So again, going back to this very simplified example with only using arrival time information for the localization. When you add a third detector, now you have HL, HB, and LB, right? So you end up having three annuli, but the only potential locations for the source are where the annuli intersect and these the intersection points are only two so here um i don't know if you can see this properly but this is this says s and then there is this s prime um which correspond to the the two intersection points so you kind of reduce these large annuli to these small locuses where from where the source could have come and adding a fourth detector uh, serves to break that de degeneracy. So you, instead of having two points, which are separated, right, um, you'll probably have one single point. Well, it won't necessarily be a point, right, depending on how 
loud the signal is in different detectors, you will get some kind of blob shaped localization. So this is this is just to give you a little like a basic intuition, but I suggest that you read further if you're interested and um, not as familiar with the subject. So as most of you already know, the first detection of a binary black hole merger was with, and the first LIGO detection of an astrophysical source was um, GW150914. So as I was mentioning here, the gravitation wave detectors in practice convert these pulses of voltage into strain data. So strain is delta L over L, which is the differential change in the arm length over the length of the arm. So you can see why the longer the arm length is, the more sensitive a gravitational wave detector is to a particular signal. And what is remarkable about this particular gravitational wave merger was how exactly the measured strain data matches up with the numerical relativity template. So you can actually see the gravitational wave signal by eye in the time series data, which is really remarkable. And this is unfortunately not the usual case, right? So in practice, the time series data is not what is used to determine whether or not a signal is present in the data. What is it really, what is, what is used more frequently is this time frequency spectrogram plot. And here you can see the characteristic chirp of a binary black hole signal that um, has a larger amplitude than the surrounding noise here. And through the process of template matching, the, um, and of course, after checking the data for any um, spurious loud noise sources known as glitches, the um, gravitational wave scientists can determine whether a signal is present in the data or not. And since GW150914, there have been several tons of binary black hole mergers that are detected. And uh, you can see how, um, what the landscape looked like before LIGO. So these were the electromagnetically uh, measured uh, black hole systems as well as neutron star systems in the galaxy. And with the addition of LIGO, you start populating this entire parameter space. And so we're very excited that after O3, we have so many more binary black hole detections and many more neut binary neutron star systems. And we hope that in the upcoming observing run, which is known as O4, we more, much more of this parameter space would be filled with the detections. Okay, um, so I would be remiss if I didn't speak about GW170817, which is the only known multi-messenger source um, of gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation so far. But let me start with a little bit of background on what are the different electromagnetic counterparts to gravitational wave sources. So this diagram by Metzger and Berger, and again shown in uh, Metzger 2019, shows how the merger of two neutron stars or a neutron star black hole can form a central engine, which could be a black hole or a magnetar. And from that launches a short gamma ray burst which lasts about order of one second. And when that collimated material shocks the interstellar medium, you get what is known as an afterglow. And this afterglow is detected at, detectable at wider angles, still not very wide angles, but you have to be you know, within some small angle of this um, jet, right? 
and is detectable in the optical wavelengths, infrared wavelengths, and radio on much longer time scales. So this is a relatively short-lived short optical transient. However, there's another more isotropic counterpart to a merger system, which is known as a kilonova. This kilonova peaks on the order of a day after the merger. And um, it, it has uh, different components to it, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail. And so this kilonova um, is mainly radiating in the optical and the near infrared. And it is the radioactive decay of art process elements, uh, which I'll also explain. And so when the kilonova ejectiles or shocks the interstellar medium, you also get a radio counterpart here. And that radio counterpart is also detectable years after the merger. So this may seem like a bit of a digression, but this is just to, um, to motivate why our process nucleosynthesis is interesting. So our process nucleosynthesis is rapid neutron um, R process refers to the rapid neutron capture process and this is in contrast with the slow neutron capture process so in order to understand R process you it's better to start understanding S process first so the S process occurs over time scales of thousands of years and are known to occur in AGB stars so the basic idea is this, you have um, some element, you have a heavy seed nucleus, which captures a neutron and undergoes beta decay. And since this occurs over a slow enough time scale, the nucleus can only capture so many neutrons before it becomes unstable and has to undergo beta decay to form a new element. And thus you can see how from silver, you can climb up um, and form heavier and heavier elements over thousands of years. Now, in contrast, a similar thing is happening actually for rapid neutron capture process, except for the fact that the captures are actually occurring, this, this whole process occurring over the time scale of a few seconds. So, the heavy seed nucleus ends up capturing so many neutrons in a very small period of time without allowing enough time for the element to undergo beta decay. So you can, in this way, you can form very, very heavy elements very rapidly. So as you can imagine, this process can only occur in certain unique environments, which have several free neutrons available and are extremely dense. And so the main site that um, has been proposed for our process nuclear synthesis is neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers. Um, and I put here in parentheses, perhaps core collapse supernovae or collapsers are also capable of, of synthesizing heavy elements. Um, and that's, uh, that's a subject of much further investigation. So back to 17 the gravitational wave signal from GW170817 was first detected. You can see this um, time frequency spectrogram and this long characteristic binary neutron star chirp signal. And just two seconds after the gravitational waves, there was a detection of gamma rays um, coming from the same part of the sky. So now, as I mentioned earlier, you do see this sort of banana-shaped localization from the two detector network. This is the, the lighter green, green ellipse is just the LIGO detectors. But with the addition of Virgo, the localization annulus reduces significantly. And this is because Virgo actually didn't detect the signal, even though it should have been loud enough to appear in Virgo's data stream. So that points towards the signal being located in Virgo's, in the null of Virgo's antenna pattern. So this, this non-detection can actually help constrain further 
where the source came from in the sky. And so coincident with this position, the um, Fermi GVM also detected a gamma ray burst signal. And uh, that led to a slew of optical, IR, X-ray, UV, and radio telescopes following up the source. And trying to, first of all, trying to identify where the source came from. So 10.9 hours after the, um, uh, after the source was, was detected, um, SWOP, so, SWOP found the exact location um, where GW1780 was coming from in the galaxy NGC 4993. And so your exercise tomorrow will be um, uh, a little more in detail about this approach, which is known as galaxy targeted follow-up. So I won't get into that much now. And um, following that, there are many optical and uh, infrared X-ray radio telescopes that detected GW17817 give and provided it in an exquisite data set. So I'll spend a moment talking about this GRB associated with 17817, which I'm terming here as a short burst of gamma rays. So this is because um, you can see in the star here where GRB 170817A is located relative to the population of gamma ray bursts in this diagram of isotropic energy and redshift. And so GRB 170817A is one of the closest um, short GRBs known. Sorry. So, um, but you can also tell that its isotropic energy is much lower than any of the measured short gamma ray bursts. And so this led to some, uh, de this was a very puzzling thing, but it led to some more detailed observations to understand more about what is the geometry of this gamma ray burst and what's actually happening here. So the model that was proposed was this cocoon models where there is a material, I mean, where there is a cocoon of material surrounding the jet of the gamma ray burst. But the question for a long time was, did the jet successfully escape or was it a trapped or a choked jet? And so observations conducted with the VLBI revealed that yes, indeed, the jet was successful and there was measurements of superluminal motion from the jet. The kilonova is a whole nother um, uh, discovery and gave us many insights. So here's a model showing um, uh, the geometry of Kilanovi from uh, Kaysen et al. 2017. So you can see here that there are different um, expected remnants from mergers of neutron stars and neutron star and black holes result in different compositions for the ejected material. And so just to guide your eye, there's these blue regions correspond to lanthanide free lighter R process elements, whereas the redder regions correspond to lanthanide rich heavy R process elements. And kilonovae are generally thought to be composed into uh, two different distinct components. The first component is the dynamical ejecta component, which in which the um, R process elements are generated and ejected as the merger occurs. And this has um, a, a polar component to it, as well as a tidal component. This is the dynamical ejecta. And the second component is the disk wind ejecta in which the final remnant that's formed, whether it be a, um, a long-lived neutron star or a black hole, forms our process elements in the disk surrounding the, the central remnant and then liberates them as disk outflows or disk wind ejector. 
and so um so later i think it's on day three you'll be working with uh kilanova models and you'll probably notice that there's this tidal tidal eject i mean sorry this dynamical ejector and wind ejector components and so from the observed light curve of gw1717 remarkably you can see these two components present namely you can see this lighter bluer um uh, lanthanide free component that decays very quickly and then you have this long lasting redder and near infrared component which is a signature of heavier elements being generated and furthermore there were longer time longer scale um, mid infrared uh, observations conducted of gw1717 at i believe around 40 days and about 70 days after the merger which showed that in fact yes there is a signal present there there was the source present in the mid infrared and this actually showed that second and third peak elements were generated. So the heaviest of the heavy elements were indeed generated in, in GW1717. So there are still many open questions, however. Um, and 1717 managed to answer some of them. So previously, there were uh, studies multidisciplinary studies that pointed towards the sources of our process nucleosynthesis um, and namely constrained the rates of such events as well as the amount of ejecta yield that would come from each event. These include measurements of deep sea plutonium, measurements from asteroids um, and meteorites, uh, galactic chemical evolution, and measurements of dwarf halo galaxies, oh, sorry, dwarf galaxies and halo stars. And 1708-17 actually nicely falls here as, as the kilonova and the binary neutron star merger, it nicely falls in the region that we expect it to fall. So that's great. So basically shows that um, kilonova can, ex can explain the expected rates and the yield that um, are needed in order to um, uh, explain the abundances that the total abundances that are measured um, however one open question is um, so this is a periodic table showing where the astrophysical sites where all of these different elements were generated and so these, um, these squares that are marked in gold in the periodic table correspond to our process elements. But what we don't really know is whether in GW1717 were all of these elements generated in the right ratios. Um, so is the, are the relative abundances of each of these elements um, explained from kilonovae or do we need other r process nucleosynthesis sites so this is a big open question still because you only have one detection of a kilonova furthermore oh yes, um sorry yes and uh, furthermore this um detection of 17 and 17 has implications for the Hubble constant and equation of state. So, um, using info, using the independently determined distance from the gravitational waves and the redshift of the electromagnetic counterpart, you can constrain the um, uh, the Hubble parameter further and help resolve the tension between. Um, the Planck measurements and the supernova 1A measurements, for example. And as Michael spoke about earlier, um, 1717 was integral in inferring more about the nuclear equation of state um, within neutron stars. 
combined and and recently uh, this is not even the most update up to date um, figure here um, recently this has been combined with um, sorry this is uh, this is showing inclusion of nicer as well as um, 190425 um, which help further constrain the nuclear equation of state so um, I'll leave you with a couple of insights and open questions here. So just to summarize, the insights that 17017 gave us were that this is the first evidence that bind neutron star mergers are progenitors of short GRBs and kilonovae. It helped constrain the nuclear equation of state, um, measurements of Hubble constant, and uh, gave us insights into our process nucleosynthesis. There are still many open questions, which is that is 17817 actually representative of the entire binary neutron star population? We think the answer is actually no. And this comes from what we've learned from the third observing run. What can we learn about the fate of the remnant? So this, this may require more sensitive gravitational wave observatories. Um, how precisely can we constrain the Hubble parameter? And finally, um, are kilonovae the only site of our process nucleosynthesis, or could they just be one amongst many other sites? So um, now I'll talk a little bit about what we learned from LIGO's third observing run. So this is sort of a different representation of um, a plot I showed earlier showing the entire population of compact binary sources detected um, up until now. And this is showing um, uh, showing these detections in quantities that are quite relevant to us as astronomers who are trying to look for these. So on the y-axis, you see luminos luminosity distance to the source. And um, the size of these circles is dictated by the size of the localization. And so, um, the larger circles correspond to smaller localizations and the smaller circles actually correspond to these larger localizations. So you can see where 17817 is placed here in this diagram as a source located at 40 megaparsecs and at um, you know, a localization of, I believe, um, 30-ish square degrees. So it's a very accessible source to us as astronomers. But during O3, we were, um, we had many detections of compact binary sources that were far more distant and much more poorly localized than we were, um, than at least at the beginning we were prepared for. And so that pose a significant challenge for us as astronomers to try to detect these um, electromagnetic counterparts. So the first um, binary neutron star event of O3 was GW190425. And um, I'll show you here. Um, so this is a video of ZTF piling the localization of GW190425 in the R and G bands and um, Gatini IR tiling the localization um, in the J band. The first thing you'll notice is that this is a, a gigantic localization. This was a single detector event and thus the localization constraints are extremely poor. Um, ZTF, even with ZTF's large field of view, this was a huge challenge for us to um, tile the entire localization in a meaning meaningful amount of time. Um, and these, the, the order in which we conduct these observations, the sky map are dictated by what are known as scheduling algorithms, which help optimize the amount of probability that we cover within the sky map um, while accounting for things like how fast is the sky map set on the sky? How much time do we have left um, to observe this, this localization? Um, and other constraints like that. 
So the first challenge here is coverage. Um, how do we get from 40 square degrees to 10,000 square degrees? Um, and how are we able to manage our observations? Um, uh, so you can see here, for those of you who are not able to read it, it says, um, uh, this person says, oh, I found it, and is holding a needle that they found from the haystack. And the other person saying, congratulations, it took you only 65,298 seconds. So, so this is this is sort of the problem that we're dealing with, right? Even if we can, even if we conduct observations, rapid observations of the sky map, because the sky maps are so large, it becomes a huge challenge to detect the kilonova in time, which I'm sure you all remember fades extremely quickly in the optical bands. Um, this is a very quick reminder here um, uh, from Michael's talk that um, this wiki transit facility is a 47 square degree field of view imager mounted on Palomar 48 inch telescope and scans the entire northern sky in three nights, uh, actually every two nights, I'm sorry. So, but um, the point here is that um, during these, um, during the detection of a gravitational wave event, ZTF goes into target of opportunity mode, which interrupts the normal survey operations in order for ZTF to slew to a particular location in the sky and conduct its observations dedicatedly in that region. Okay. Um, so with uh, this, with ZTF, we conducted several follow-ups during LIGO's third observing run. And particularly to note are the second confirmed by the neutron star event, as well as two neutron star black hole events, which I'll talk about um, in a couple of slides. In a couple of slides. Um, there was also this uh, mass, mass gap, initially mass gap event, which um, initially we thought to be a neutron star black hole candidate, but is most likely a binary black hole motor. But uh, the punchline here is that no kilonovae were found throughout LIGO's third observing run. But here are some uh, statistics to keep in mind. So we followed up 13 gravitational wave events and had about 2 million ZTF alerts within those gravitational wave events. So you'll be working with um, alert queries later, right after this, um, right after this talk. So you get to actually see what the alerts look like, see what the candidates look like. Um, and you'll also get a preview into the observations as well. So from these, uh, this 2 million alerts, we were able to reduce the number of interesting ZDF candidates that could be um, potential kilonovae to about 100. And then we applied our kilonova rejection criteria, um, which is mainly used to weed out various kinds of imposters that we detect in our data. Um, and that led us to zero kilonovae. Um, and I'll, men I'll, I'll explain what I mean by kilonovae rejection criteria in a moment. Um, so this is one serendipitous source that we, um, that we identified during our triggered TO searches, um, which was an untriggered GRB afterglow at a redshift of 1.26. So this is the um, cutout image, you can see the source located here, and it's missing from the reference. You can see that the light curve is declining extremely fast, um, but ultimately the spectrum is what reveals to us that this is not actually um, a kilonova or even a short GRB afterglow. Um, and as I mentioned, spectroscopy is an important aspect here, um, as shown here, these all of these objects were spectroscopically classified to be not kilonovae. But there are other criteria as well, which is that um, when the gravitational wave uh, sky map updates, um, you can exclude certain transients because they're in inconsistent with, were consistent with the initial localization, 
but are inconsistent with the updated localization. Um, if the redshift of the source, which are which is measured by some other means, gal including galaxy association, if that's inconsistent with the distance to the gravitational wave source, we can e exclude it. Um, of course, we can look out for these artifacts and asteroids that appear to be like Kilinovi, but um, upon close inspection, uh, don't appear to be so. And finally, most powerful, arguably the most powerful criteria that we use here is photometric rejection criteria. So when um, ZTF detects uh, a transient, we try to get at least two observations of that object so that we can measure the decay rate. Um, so how quickly is the source evolving? If the source is actually evolving slowly, then we know that it's inconsistent with what we expect. And furthermore, even for fast evolving sources, it's important to perform post photometry in order to exclude any kind of previous history. Um, and I'll quickly mention here, I'm not, you know, there's, there's so many other things that I could uh, potentially talk about, I guess, but um, quickly mention here that just because we didn't detect a counterpart doesn't mean we can't do science with our observations. Uh, so this is showing one particular study um, that was led by uh, Siddharth Mohite at um, UW Milwaukee. Um, and so here you can see that with the observation we conducted the ZDF and with an astrophysical prior that we apply on what we expect Kilinovi to actually look like. Um, we can start to infer information about the source. And this really depends on our observations being deep enough and covering enough of the localization. So in this case, this was more of a demonstrative study that if we were able to get really good observations of a given source, um, that we could that we could actually constrain um, uh, what the um, potential uh, uh, parameters of the source would be. So in this case, we mainly focused on the absolute magnitude, peak absolute magnitude, um, or sorry, starting absolute magnitude and the decay rate of a potential kilonova located um, in the localization of GW190425. But um, in practice, one could even do this with ejecta masses and, um, uh, and inclination angles. And so, um, a little bit on neutron star black hole mergers, which are another feature entirely. So as I mentioned, um, two of the events that we followed up were these two neutron star black hole mergers, um, GW200105 and GW200115. Um, so um, again, these had relatively large localizations and this shows um, our ZT of tiling and the limiting magnitudes um, in terms of absolute magnitude that we achieved for these two, um, uh, that we achieved for these two uh, localizations. Now, again, um, we were not able to successfully detect a counterpart. As I mentioned, there were no counterparts that we detected during O3. But you can do science with non-detections. So um, here are the limits that we placed with ZTF on this uh, grid of Kilonova models. This is actually from POSIS, and we'll be working with some uh, POSIS models later in school. So you can see that um, the ZTF observations, if you take the deepest limits from each night, they actually um, constrain some portion of the kilonova model space in the case of GW200105. And these models, which are parameterized by the ejecta mass and the um, ink, sorry, the, the two ejecta mass components, so that is the wind ejecta mass, dynamical ejecta mass, and the inclination angle, as well as the half opening angle um, 
which in this study we, we just fix. Um, the constraints that we place on these models can actually con translate to constraints on the ejector mass from a potential kilonova associated with this. Um, so in this case, one can exclude um, a significant portion of the um, wind and dynamical ejecta space, assuming that the kilonova was um, at a favorable or low inclination angle. Um, so rel relatively face on. Um, and you can see how we are really not sensitive to these edge on cases. So we can't really, you know, we can't really place any additional constraints. Um, and these, um, these constraints on the ejector masses and inclination angles can actually be translated to constraints on binary parameters. So with deep enough observations, um, we can constrain large neutron star radii, low mass ratios, and highly aligned black hole spins, which are all quantities that we are generally more um, sensitive to because these, these particular combinations of parameters produce brighter kilonovae. Um, and I'll close up this section by saying that, um, so um, amongst the neutron star black hole mergers that we um, observe with Zuki Transit Facility, perhaps um, our electromagnetic observations can tell us um, things that, uh, you know, perhaps it makes sense that we didn't detect a counterpart, right? Um, so this is a plot showing um, M1 and M2 of the two uh, component masses of um, the neutron star black hole system. And um, as I mentioned earlier, when you have, um, you really need low mass ratios in order to produce detectable kilonovae because otherwise um, you might end up with a situation where um, the neutron star is swallowed whole by the black hole and doesn't emit any electromagnetic radiation. So um, in the case of GW200105, we expect that's probably what happened. Um, but in the case of uh, GW200115, um, even though you might have you know, somewhat equal mass ratio, the negative spin makes it much more difficult to detect um, an electromagnetic counterpart, even though generally higher spins, higher aligned spins tend to help us. Um, this event is kind of excluded because um, it's likely a BBH signal. And even in the small chance that it is a, um, a black hole neutron star merger, the, the mass ratio is highly unequal. And finally, um, uh, GW190426 might be one of the only uh, neutron star black hole systems in which um, uh, in which a counterpart could be detectable, but you know it's not a very confident event, so we don't even know if it's completely real. Okay, um, so let me briefly uh, conclude here with some prospects for multi messenger astrophysics. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight here um, is uh, what is known as treasure map. Um, so treasure map is um, treasure map is basically a database in which various different telescopes can upload their observations um, onto a given gravitational sky map. So this is the sky map. Um, this is the you know, final localization of GW190425. Um, and with your, you know, um, if you're observing with a single telescope, you only get so much information um, based on just your observations. But this provides a public platform in which you can track in real time um, the different observations that are doing by others, that, that are being done by others in the community and um, use that to sort of curate your future plans. So here you can see um, these are detections with the SWIFT UVOT 
inside the gravitational localization. Um, this is the Swift X-ray telescope. Um, another here's another um, wide field optical survey known as GoTo, and um, their tiles over the localization. And so this is a this is a very neat tool. Um, that can be used to uh, gain information and strategize so that everyone isn't pointing necessarily at the same exact point in the sky. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to highlight that. Okay, I hope you can see my slides again. Um, okay. And um, I just wanted to quickly highlight some of what you're going to see later in this school. So, um, there are many, many different moving parts here that uh, go together to towards our underlying goal of discovering and characterizing kilonovae. So this includes, as I mentioned earlier, optimizing telescope scheduling strategy, which has been described in some papers, um, streamlining the candidate vetting process. So both of these components um, are actually uh, uh, dealt with with Sky Portal. So you'll see um, in Geiner's talk later um, description of these both uh, both of these functionalities. Um, candidate vetting process is further described um, in some of these uh, papers on ZTF, real time search and triggering. And Igor will be talking about this um, in more detail. Um, new and um, improved kilonova models can be used to um, more realistically understand about the properties of these kilonovae and um, uh, you'll be working with this these model grids uh, later in the school um, simulated observing scenarios can help us understand what to expect in further observing runs so um, Andrew will be giving a talk on this simulated sky map set, which hopefully should be um, helpful there. Um, there's also, um, I talked a little bit about this constraints from non-detections using the Nimbus code. Um, there are some other papers describing this. There's also constraints you can place with detections, right? Um, which are more powerful. And so um, uh, homework number three is gonna deal with the nuclear, nuclear multi-messenger astronomy framework, um, which deals with this problem exactly. Um, and um, looking on the horizon, there will be more sensitive facilities available for kilonova follow-up. Um, and especially since we know that kilonovae are um, bright in the near infrared bands, um, winter, uh, an upcoming near infrared telescope will be very powerful in kilonova detection. So you can see Viraj's talk on that. Um, and as uh, Michael mentioned earlier, SEDM V2 is going to be really powerful um, in rapidly characterizing our candidate counterparts. Um, so Yashvi will be talking about um, SEDM V2. I think it's on the last day. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this slide, which is um, just to say that the, the future of multi-messenger astronomy is bright. And um, uh, with uh, next generation gravitational wave detectors, we expect to see most of the astrophysical mergers in the entire universe. Um, you can see this, this diagram is going to some crazy large redshifts. And so we'll need um, state-of-the-art uh, facilities in various wavelengths in order to characterize the counterparts um, to these gravitational wave sources. Um, and that's pretty much all I had. So thank you very much. <laughs>